we want to um, welcome all of our guests. Uh, good evening. Thanks for joining the Cincinnati Alumni Chapter on what is our um, third installment of our mini series called Adulting 101. Um, this evening, we are very pleased to be talking about real estate, the do's and don'ts of buying your first house. So hopefully this will hopefully make you, uh, you know, I'm gonna say better, more aware of the things you should be doing and sometimes more importantly, what you should not be doing. Um, this evening, our presenter is a dear friend of mine. He, and in fact, we have known each other at least, at least 35 years. Okay, that, which is a very scary thought, isn't it? So um, he is a former, well, back in the day, it was regional director. We now have regional vice presidents, but it was the same, same role. And uh, he has also been provincial vice president. He is a Golden Council member of the fraternity, an initiate of the Theta Kappa chapter at the University of Akron, and still living in the area and is involved with the Cleveland, what is it called? Cleveland Akron Canton? No, did no, I get just backwards? Cleveland Akron Alumni Chapter. Cleveland Akron Alumni Chapter. And I'm thinking, of, I'm thinking of the airport. So I'm thinking of the airport. And um, anyway, he's just an all around great guy. He is also in real estate, uh, an agent up in that area. So if you are ever looking for a house up there, he is the man to call. So with that, um, I have to uh, introduce one of the best people on the planet that I know, and that is our brother, Sam Shaheen. So Sam, the microphone and the screen are yours. Well, Mary, you're very, very kind. Thank you very much for that introduction, that glowing introduction. Um, this is a pretty basic uh, presentation. I'm not going to get into a great deal of detail because of the uh, limited amount of time that we have, but we'll get into talking about it and, uh, you know, offline afterwards, if, if you want to get into more detail, I'm more than happy to, to sit down and talk with you. Um, so uh, just uh, some contact information. Uh, that's my, uh, my logoing and uh, I am Theta Kappa 127, went to the University of Akron. Uh, I am on the Golden Council of Delta Sigma Pi. My phone number is on the bottom. I also put that information into the chat box. So you can look at it there. You can copy it, throw it away, whatever. Um, so the agenda. What I want to do is talk about uh, why buy real estate, uh, current market conditions, and then kind of like a little how-to. And that's, that's all on the re residential real estate side. Then we'll spend just a little bit of time touching on um, investments in real estate. And then um, we'll go into uh, jobs in the real estate um, or the real, the real estate or estate, whichever little typo there, um, uh, in the real estate business. So if you're interested in that piece, we'll, 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 I'll touch on that a little bit as well. So, how do you deal with this topic? It's kind of a, there's so much to it. I mean, it's huge. It's a, it's just such a, a long topic. I thought I'd go down and, and like come up with reasons why to buy a house. Uh, they will tell you that real estate is arguably one of the best investments that you can make in your life. And I will tell you that you can find studies that'll tell you the S&P goes up more than real estate does. And I honestly, I believe that, but you got to live someplace and it's better than paying rent because every time you write a rent check, guess what happens? It goes away. You never see it again. But if you throw that money into a piece of real estate, into a house that you live in, it's not only functional for you, but more importantly, you're building equity and some 15, 20, 30 years from now, guess what happens? You own it. And all the appreciation that's gone into it, you get. It's all yours. Um, so, you know, here are the 10 reasons that, that um, you want to, you know, think about to, to buy a house. Um, and uh, the first one is, you know, prices tend to rise over time. Uh, number two is there is a tax break for mortgage interest. So if you uh, have mortgage interest, the interest uh, can be de deducted. 
Um, and what's interesting is that deduction will allow you to take other deductions as well. Uh, deductions that normally you don't have access to if, uh, uh, if, you, don't, uh, if you don't deduct mortgage interest. Um, number three, you get to buy a piece of real property, something that's, you know, that's important to have and to hold. Um, and and uh, it's, it's, good, it's, it's, a, it's a good thing to, to do. And I'll, I'll touch on that again in a minute here. Currently, interest rates are very low, but they're starting to inch up again. We've noticed about um, a quarter to a half point increase in interest rates uh, just here in the last month or so. And we do believe um, we do believe that the interest rates will be about about a half point this year, but they're still historically very very low. If you can get if you can get three percent money to do anything, you can definitely out earn it. I mean the the current increase in housing prices is about historically is about seven percent. So would you borrow money at three percent to earn seven percent? Uh, yeah, I think so. It makes a lot of sense to me. Um, you can use the equity in your in your home for other purposes. So that's the home equity line of credit. You can uh, use it to uh, to build onto the house, to improve the house. You can use it to uh, uh, pay for uh, medical expenses, educational expenses, um, starting a business, anything anything like that uh, that you want. Um, next, um, emotional stability and, and, uh, you'll have stability and emotional security in owning a home. Um, you feel good. You, you feel good about yourself. You feel about uh, good about making that payment every month. And remember every time you make that payment, every time you make that payment that you're investing in yourself, it's, Kind of like what I would call a forced savings program, wouldn't you think? Um, you can redecorate it and renovate it any way you'd like. You can play home home garden TV. You can uh, you can make it look you can, you can make it look uh, the way you want. Paint it the colors you want. Yeah, you. I had a guy up the road from my house who painted his house bright orange. He put a a white stripe down the middle of it. It looked like a square Cleveland Browns football helmet. He can do that. So it's just one of the other things. Um, you can have a garden if you want. You can, uh, you can make a patio. You can put a, um, a nice uh, brick fireplace or something of, those, of, of that nature into the property. Something that, that helps you to relax, wind down at the end of the day, glass of wine or something along those lines. I think the next two are really rather important. You're putting down roots in your community. Because what you'll find is that when you buy a house and you're putting down roots, what you're, uh, what you're doing is you're caring about your community. And because you're caring about your community, you do things for your community. Um, you care about the school board. You care about, uh, you care about what legislation, what crime activity, all that stuff that's going on, um, you care about. You, you care about the local football teams. You care about all kinds of different things. Um, and then you'll have a tendency to get involved in community affairs and you'll, you'll spend some time uh, in those things. So those are 10 great reasons to buy a house. Uh, and financially, I think it's a, it's a great move for, for people. And it's one of those things where, you know, you got to think about it a little bit. You got to plan for it a little bit. Um, so we'll we'll talk now. Uh, let's talk a little bit about um, market conditions, and then we'll get into the concept of how do you actually go about buying a house. Um, first off, things are different from market to market to market. Okay. Houses in Cincinnati are different than houses in Columbus. Then they're different from houses in the Akron, Canton, Cleveland market. Um, there are different values. There's different uh, traditions um, uh, that are held in the markets and how we deal with things. Um, it used to be uh, used to be that the waiting time to get into a house was 30 days. Um, 
So after you close them alone, you, you can sit out of the house for 30 days. That's uh, uh, in some markets completely gone away. And then in other markets, yeah, it's still, it's still out there. Um, so things are a little bit different. And if I say something here and you find it different, probably is because your market is different. And I'll be honest, I'm not an expert in Cincinnati, Dayton, Columbus, any of those things. I know my market. Um, it is a heavy seller's market. It is highly oriented towards, um, uh, towards selling properties. The, um, there are way, way, way too many buyers, way, way, way too few sellers right now. Uh, it is not unusual for a house to sit on the market. It, it comes on market and it's off the market within hours. Um, and that's true in all three major markets in Ohio, Columbus, uh, Cincinnati, and, and, uh, and uh, Cleveland. Uh, it, could be, it, it could be overbid by 10%, 15% over asking price. Uh, does that mean the, the realtor did a really bad job of valuing the house? No, it's just the market. The market is really kind of crazy right now. So if you're going to get into the market, you make sure and have a good realtor who knows what they're doing because that realtor is going to help guide you through that transaction and make sure that you're not tremendously overpaying and that you do get your deal when you, when you want to get your deal. Uh, like I said, there is an inventory shortage. There's a lot of reasons for that. Number one, first and foremost, interest rates. Interest rates are really, really low. And because they're so low, people are trying to lock in those rates as they, they get a house. Like I said, 3% money fixed rate is, is pretty awesome. Um, there's a housing shortage because there's a lot of people coming out of apartments. That's the other major driver. Mary, did you have something? Oops, sure did. Uh, and actually, Kevin Wright asked this question. He said, if there is low inventory on properties available in your area, um, should you try to be aggressive and secure a property? Or is it better to wait until the inventory is not so low? Well, there's more than one consideration, Kevin. Uh, as simple as it is, how bad do you need a residence? I mean, do you need to move now? Uh, things that, that cause people to move residences or change residences aren't just financial. Um, might be you've gotten married and might be you have a baby on the way. Might be that um, you've downsized and, uh, you know, the, the family's getting smaller. Um, Times houses go on the market because uh, somebody passes away. If it's time to buy, um, you know, it's it could be a job thing. Maybe you you you're, you're you've got a new job across town, and the commute time is not tolerable for you currently. There's a lot of different reasons why you might elect to, you know, get a a new residence, and they aren't all financial. So, you know, you pay attention to all of those reasons, not just the financial reason. Now, if financial is your only reason, um, I, think the, the, I think most people will tell you that the best time to buy a house in rising, in rising price times is before prices rise too much further. Real estate rarely goes down in value. It does sometimes, uh, 2007, 2008, was a good example of that. Uh, but that's because there was an extraordinary event from outside the real estate market that, that caused that. And it was very unusual. Um, and I don't see that type of an event coming. Right now, we're seeing about 35% equity in homes. Um, consequently, people are not going to be in a rush to get out of their homes or have problems with foreclosures or forbearance. You're hearing a, a lot about that in the, in the popular media right now. They're wrong because there's too much equity in, in the general markets right now. So we don't see that coming. 
Um, Sam, so Kevin responded, he says, to answer your question, Sam, I uh, would like to potentially have a home within the next calendar year. I'm very intentional with trying to take my time with this process. That's, that's good. So here's what I would recommend at this point, Kevin. Uh, get a hold of a good realtor. And if you need some help with that, I can help you with that. Um, but get a hold of a good realtor. Define for that realtor what you're looking for. Tell them your time frame. Tell them your considerations, okay? Um, things that are important, style of home, number of bedrooms, uh, whether you want um, a de detached garage or, or, or whether a garage is important to you at all. Do you want a basement or not? What style of home is, do you want a ranch? Do you want uh, conventional? Do you want two-story, any number of, choices there. Budget is probably the most important piece of it because you got to be able to afford the house that uh, that you want to get into. I'm, I'm talking about some of this a little bit later, but you know, since the, since the question's up now, you know, your budget's important. You, if you can't make the payments, that's not a good thing. Trust me on this. Um, so uh, why do you want to do that now if you're not for the moment ready, as long as you can have your ears to the ground, you might catch the bargain house because houses do come out on the market and houses do, you know, come out underpriced and you might be able to jump on something if you have a good realtor watching for you. And um, a good realtor will send you listings every day telling you what's out on the market and, um, and what to look at. Uh, I uh, highly recommend though, don't play the Zillow game, not picking on Zillow per se, but realtor.com, Zillow, Trulia, any of those. Those companies are all set up to sell leads to realtors, not to find you a house, okay? So what you need to do is you need to get to a professional realtor and have them organize your search. You know, I kind of look at it like a funnel. I take all 10,000 properties, 10,000 plus properties in Northeastern Ohio. I put them in the funnel. I shake the funnel. And then what happens is houses start to fall out the bottom, okay? And the few that stick in are the houses that are a possibility because maybe they're in the right area. Maybe they're the right style, the right price, et cetera. And then we, we look at that list, but it's still a list of 1,000 properties or something. So we narrow it down some more, shake the funnel again. And we keep doing that until we get down to maybe three or six properties. And then you have a list you can work with. And you keep doing that until you find the right property. You're making a lifelong purchase or at least one that's gonna last you for a long time. So you wanna make sure it's right. Yes, Mary. Yeah, Sam, how much, um, uh, how much does it cost for a buyer to use a realtor? That's a great question. That's an absolutely great question. It does not cost a nickel for a buyer. All realty fees in the, in the current environment are paid by sellers. Typically speaking, a seller is going to pay six to 7%, depending upon the market, of the value of the sale value of their house. That listing agent will split that money with the buying agent. So essentially, a buying agent gets paid for paid by the seller, uh, but there's no influence from the seller, even though they're paying the bill. Um, the, the buying agent works for you uh, as a buyer and you don't have to pay any fees. Now, in my particular case, my broker has a $250 brokerage fee, but that's a broker fee. It's not a real estate fee. And that's the only fee you pay uh, you know, for, for real estate services. So just to make sure you all, all heard exactly what he said. Basically, you would hire a realtor, okay? You're not gonna be paying them anything, but basically they are gonna be a personal shopper for you. They know who is hitting the market sooner than you know which houses are hitting. So they can, like in Kevin's situation, he has a little bit of time here, but mm -hmm. having that real estate agent can help him you know, avoid a lot of, um, I'm gonna say a lot of woe and a lot of searching by having that person, I hate to say shopping for you, but yeah, you are definitely on, uh, You, Kevin will be on his real estate agents, um, a realtor's um, radar 
for what they're looking for. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and 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 again, it's it's one of those deals where agents know the game. It is not. An, I had a guy ask me the other day. I have this really young couple. They've been married for three years, coming out into the market out of an apartment for the first time, and they're frustrated because they've been playing the guilt the Zillow game. It didn't work in for them, right? And I'm at. I've I've shown them two houses so far. Okay. And everything I've seen so far has been snapped up like right away. They made a couple offers, not successful. Okay, fine. I said, let me help you. So they they agreed. And he he looked at me at, at a point in time. He goes, well, how long do you think this is going to take? I said, well, it's going to take a minimum of 20 showings and at least 30 days for me to find you the right house. He stood back. You, you'd have thought his jaw hit the ground. He was surprised at those numbers, but that's what I expect. I expect 30 days and 20 houses. Now, I just had one, uh, a couple of the uh, young married couple, they aren't quite married yet. Uh, I met him in the end of January, showed him some houses. We found a place uh, signed uh, three weeks ago. Got them a deal three weeks ago. Got the loan closed, and they have their house. They they signed. They got their keys to their house uh, uh, yesterday. So it can happen. It can happen. I showed them about six houses. So that's the way the game plays, you know. And we know it as realtors. You know what we know what to expect, and and don't you know the, the ones that kill me are the ones who 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 keep apologizing for taking my time. Time out. It's my job, <laughs> and I'm happy to do it. I I have fun doing this. This is a lot of fun for me. So, so that's good. And to the audience, there are a few more questions um, that you guys have asked, and I'll we'll answer those or we'll address those as we get to that content in the presentation. So, okay, thanks. Um, forecast: um, Interest rates are starting to increase. I already mentioned that. Housing starts are up uh, in 2020. They were up in 2020, but they were down in January for some reason. But um, the other predictor that we look at is um, how many new permits, and they were up in the new permits were up in January. So the housing market is going pretty heavily. Uh, the builders are, are, are building as, as quick as they can. They are having COVID problems. Um, a, a lot of people don't want to work, can't work, whatever, because of COVID, and building supplies. Who'd have thought about building supplies going crazy in price? Why? Because everybody's home during everybody was home during COVID and they were putting decks on their houses. So the building prices go up. So what are the steps to buying a house? Um, first off, you kind of decide what you want: budget, number of rooms, style, location. I kind of mentioned that in Kevin's answer. Second step, get a pre-approval. That means you go to a mortgage loan officer at a place that you want to deal. You ask, you give them some basic information about yourself and they'll, they'll give you a letter. That letter is typically good for three months. And it says, yeah, we'll lend you money. Okay. Provided all your other information is correct. And you haven't lied to me and all that good stuff. Step number three, believe it or not, is, con is contacting a professional realtor. Um, at that point, then you're going to talk about your goals and your timetable. Now, when, step number five is when we finally get to go out and start looking at houses. And at that point, your realtor should have a nice list for you to look at. Um, you'll have some days where you go out and see three or four houses in the same day. You'll have other days where it's just one. Uh, it's a little hard to remember houses when you do that. Um, but give your realtor feedback because they will learn from you based upon the feedback you give. So that's important. Uh, after you, then the next step is to make an offer. Once the offer is accepted, you'll go through inspections and appraisals. Inspections are where you hire professionals to take a good hard look at the house to make sure it's in good, good condition. Um, then there's sometimes uh, a negotiation after that to, to adjust the price for those those problems. The appraisal is um, the appraisal is where uh, the bank comes in and says this house is worth how much money, and sometimes that causes ne negotiations as well, um, because sometimes the bank says it's not near as worth as much as you uh, have offered for it. 
Uh, then there's closing. Closing is uh, the final the final step where uh, where we close the loan and give you the keys and it's your house. And now you have to do painting and everything. Um, I am going to offer you a booklet that, that describes the whole process. It's called Your Home. Uh, I will put a link into the chat window um, here in a minute. And uh, you can down, you can just grab the link and download the, this booklet. It's about, I think it's 32 pages. I could be wrong. Could be 24. I don't know. Uh, but it does take you nicely step by step through the process of buying a house. And I hope you enjoy reading it, looking through it. It won't take you long to read, but um, we will do that. Uh, now, let's talk about investments in real estate. Uh, is this a good time? Um, I'm yeah. most of the way to, through the, the basics on buying real estate for, uh, for housing purposes. Do you want to do questions at this point? Yeah, let's ask if, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, let's do, you know, since a lot of the questions that have come in are based upon the, you know, uh, buying your own personal house. Um, so uh, Vito asks, uh, does the advice you just gave uh, or just uh, apply to condos as well? Uh, yeah, the, the buying a condo is a little bit different, uh, an animal. Um, it's a, uh, uh, when you buy a condo, it's kind of like an apartment complex, if you will. Uh, I just put that link out in the chat box. Um, and um, there's a few slightly different considerations, but it's not significantly diff different. Um, I really don't um, distinguish it for, for clients. Uh, most of it should be handled by your realtor. Uh, the biggest thing you got to watch out is for condo fees, um, which is a fee you pay to the local association to cut the grass and shovel the snow and take the trash or whatever else they're, they're paying for. Okay. Um, so the other, uh, one of the other questions um, came in, it says, should you have a home inspection or should you have multiple inspections? I highly recommend you do a home inspection unless you've got an incredibly good eye. Now, if you're writing a deal and you opt not to do an inspection, that actually is an attractive thing to the seller because the seller realizes at that point that you aren't going to come back and ask for more money because uh, because the furnace is about to crap out on you. Okay, so that is a, that is a tactic that sometimes works. But I I, I highly recommend uh, and uh, a, a general inspection. I recommend a termite or what they call wood destroying insect inspection. If there's well and septic, um, you should definitely take a look at those. Um, and radon. Radon is a gas that is produced much throughout Ohio. It's trapped by the uh, rock formations and um, it allegedly causes cancer. So if it's 4.0 parts per million or whatever, um, I'm not sure what the actual measurement standard is, but if it's 4.0 or less, you're good. If it's over 4.0, then you should have it remediated. And that typically is a somewhere between 1,000, 1,500 on most houses. It could be more expensive than that. And then of course, the magic question is who's going to pay for it? You know, so there's that. Um, Alex Yurchak, uh, who's a CAC member mentioned that uh, he would also recommend getting HVAC inspection after buying the house he had issued with his furnace that was not on the inspection report. Okay. Right. Um, what I highly, also highly recommend is you get a home warranty. If you're buying the house for another 500 bucks, roughly, um, you can get a company to come in that will warrant anything that goes wrong. So if the furnace craps out, if the dishwasher breaks, if you find a leak uh, in a pipe or something like that, they'll come in and repair it and they they do it for a deductible and a service call. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a, a very wise uh, wise idea to do that. Okay. Um, so another thing, um, someone asked, I heard a couple of different things about the percentage of money that you should have down. Is three to 5% the new norm 
um, so that you have a bigger emergency fund? Is that ideal? There's a couple of things you can do. Um, first off, the minimum amount of down payment is 3.5%. You can sometimes get a bank that'll do it at three. What those do uh, is put you into what they call a Fannie Mae, Federal National Mortgage Association loan. They will guarantee the loan for you. You gotta go through another inspection for that from a Fannie Mae inspector. That can cause more problems. Uh, because those inspectors are different and they look for different things. So now you've got, on top of the general inspector, you got the Fannie Mae inspector and that costs you extra money as well. Um, you, can you can typically find a banker that'll write you a 5% down. Uh, and then anytime you're in any kind of loan, whether it's the three and a half, three, three and a half, five percent 5%, 10%, whatever, that's less than 20, anytime that you're less than 20, you have to pay a, a, a separate insurance called PMI, private mortgage insurance. And what you're doing, you'll love this one. This, this one just, it's always driven me nuts. Private mortgage insurance is where you pay insurance to the bank so that, that uh, covers them in case you don't make the payment for your house. And that blows my mind. But anyhow, um, so what will happen is they put that on the loan until your equity gets to be um, more than 20%. And at that point, they'll, they'll drop it down and you'll see, uh, you'll drop it off and you'll see that you're, you're uh, more money will go towards your principal or that payment amount will go away. I would highly recommend that if you're in that situation and that, pay, that part of the payment goes away, since you're used to it, keep making it. The more you put, the more money you drop on the mortgage, the better it is. Here's an interesting statistic. If you make one extra payment per year, just one extra payment, you will pay off your note in seven years less on a 30 year mortgage. So you'll pay it off in 23 years. Now do the math. You know how much money that'll save you? It'll save you thousands of dollars. It's a very, very smart move just for one extra payment. So um, then uh, Alex also said, uh, ask if you have any lender recommendations. Um, yeah, there's a couple kinds of lenders. There's banks and then there's um, uh, uh, mortgage loan companies. What happened, the difference is that a bank is typically buying for their own portfolio, uh, whereas mortgage lenders will buy and then resell your loan. So be comfortable with the fact that they're immediately going to send your loan off to some other processor and they're gonna package up your, your loan up with a bunch of other people's loans and investors will buy those loans. That honestly doesn't really make a difference to you other than where you send your check, okay? Now, some mortgage loan companies are easier to deal with some than, than banks. Some banks are very difficult to deal with. Um, it just depends on the bank. And um, I would highly recommend that you just talk to people and get recommendations. Your realtor will give you good names of, I mean, I keep, I keep about uh, three or four mortgage loan officers in my back pocket. Uh, there are ones who specialize in people with bad credit. Um, and um, there are other ones that will you know, give you a break for, you know, various types, like, like um, the one I'm dealing with right now, uh, a listing I sold, the uh, mortgage loan company that they're de dealing with is not requiring an appraisal because their credit is so good. So that, that's pretty cool. And another one put a loan through in 11 days. Remember the married couple that I talked about? 11 days to get the loan from, um, from application to, to cl clear, what we call clear to close. So yeah, um, talk to your realtor about that. So Sam, another question. Um, so with COVID and with people working from home, sometimes kids take doing school from home. Yeah. Um, are you seeing a trend as far as what people want in their house? Are there any changes? Actually, the, the statistics say that the COVID work at home trend is about a 21% factor. So basically one in five people are working at home because of COVID. 
they don't expect that to change much. It'll probably go to about 18%. So, uh, you know, some of those people will get back into the office in the not too distant future. Um, so we don't, we're not seeing a whole lot. What trends are we seeing? We are seeing people that want to have a nice office environment at their home that they can use. Uh, that we're seeing um, people who want to have um, uh, nice amenities at their house, whether it be a, um, a nice patio, a nice, you know, a work area where they can go out and, you know, maybe take their laptop out in the backyard and, and, and have a good and still have a decent working environment, things of that nature. Um, so yeah, there's a little bit of that, but not a huge amount of trend there. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Is that everything? That's for right now, absolutely. Okay. So let's talk about investing in real estate. Um, investing in real estate is kind of a different, kind of a whole different ball game. Um, basically, there are three general areas. One is to buy a single family home. Um, which is just that, a house that, that deals with one family. Uh, multifamily home is like an apartment complex. You would call that an apartment complex. Um, uh, and then there's commercial real estate. Commercial real estate is retail stores. Um, it could be a, a, a big industrial plant. It could be any number of different warehouse, any, any number of different things. Um, for the most part, um, you can get into these things. They are considered highly risky, uh, especially for people who don't know how to deal with them. There are management um, issues because you have to maintain the properties. Um, and I'll tell you what, there's no, there is no fun at 11 o'clock at night when the, when the tenant calls and says the toilet's overflowing. There is just no fun in that, trust me. Um, and I dabbled in that for a while. I had a duplex. We lived in one side and we had tenants on the other side and it still wasn't any fun. All we had, all I had to do was traipse down the stairs, go next door. It was no fun because I was constantly being interrupted. Although I had pretty good tenants and they were there on, on time with the rent. So um, you want to establish uh, what your rental income ratio is to the, to the property um, so that you're getting the kind of return that you want. Um, Lenders will not give you um, uh, the same types of down payments as uh, what you would get on a single family home. So what you'll find out is that you might have to put 25 or 50% down um, and that's not unusual. A lot of times too, when you go into these, um, these deals, uh, they will look at you and say, what do you know about this? Nope, we're not interested. So it's a much more difficult loan to get. Um, so that's kind of that market. Um, so we'll go, here we go, come on, there we go. Let's talk a little bit about jobs in real estate because a lot of people tend to think that uh, being a realtor is the greatest thing on the planet. Um, and I think there's, there's what you see on TV is a realtor who lives in Los Angeles or in uh, maybe Florida, and they're selling properties on the beach. Okay, these properties are million dollar properties. And when you're getting two and a half, three percent of a million dollars every time you sell something, yeah, it's a pretty lucrative business. You can make some pretty decent money. That's not real estate in Canton, Ohio. It's not real estate in Cincinnati, Ohio. You know, it just, it just isn't, you know, average take on a house, um, average take on a house is probably in the $4,000, $5,000 neighborhood. And then the, the, your realtor takes, takes a piece of that as well. So it, you know, I might go so show somebody 20 houses, I might walk away with $2,000, $2,500. It's just the way the game plays. Uh, <clears throat> you have to get education. And in Ohio, it's 160 hours. You have to take a test, which is combination state and uh, national test. Then comes the fun because you are now an independent contractor. Most it's very rare, it's very hard to find a job as a realtor that is a 
W-2 paying job. They're all 1099 jobs. Now, if you're accustomed to that and you can live on the concept that you eat what you kill, if you will, then that's okay. I mean, I mean, uh, a lot of people are accustomed to that they like that. I love it. I mean, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm very much accustomed to that. I've been on that kind of a payment plan for years and years, and you know, I've learned an important lesson about uh, being an independent contractor. If you're not making enough money, work harder. It's a pretty simple concept, right, Mary? <laughs> So um, she's she's been that her, I think that's been your whole career, hasn't it? Um, I've been on draw versus commission, or you know, but I, I always have a good commission. You know, have a salary, but you know, make a good percentage of my money based upon the sales. Yep, yep. So and I love it. Um, as a realtor, you are expected to pretty much cover all your own costs. Um, Pretty much, I get some training from my company. Um, I get a little bit of promotional materials printed. Um, they made they made that great logo that I had. I love my logo, um, and I'm playing on the Dr. Seuss thing, of course. Um, but for the most part, if I want to send out postcards because I sold a house, if I want to send out postcards to a neighborhood that I want to start marketing in, if I want to um, buy some more signs for, you know, let's say for sale to put in front of people's homes, that stuff, that's all at my expense. I got to cover it all myself. Um, so that, those are, those are all things that you got to take into consideration. All the fees for the um, multiple listing service for, um, uh, um, for the uh, National Association of Realtors and the Stark County Association of Realtors, et cetera. Ohio Realtors, I got to pay all those fees. I mean, it's just part of the game. Um, but I get to write them off, as, you know, uh, off, off of my income as, as small business expenses. Um, what are the characteristics of a, of a good realtor? If you want to be a realtor, you've got to be persistent. You've got to be tolerant. You've got to be willing to work hard. You've got to be willing to work at pretty much all hours of the day or night. I have gotten phone calls at midnight. It's just part of the game. And when people call you, you got to answer their questions. You got to answer them now. You can't put them off. And I don't care what you're doing, you know, um, having dinner with the family or, or whatever. A lot of times you just kind of have to excuse yourself. Sometimes you can get away with, with, with putting them off a little. Um, but you got to excuse yourself and go, uh, you know, talk to them and, and deal with what it is that um, uh, that they want. Um, so uh, that's that's an important piece of it. Um, another decision you have to, to, to pick up on is do you want to go alone or do you want to go on a team? A team is three or four or, or however many realtors. There are some teams that are a lot bigger than that, that um, uh, work together towards the same goal. Um, typically, the team leader it gets a lot of credit for everything uh, and may take a higher proportion of the income. Um, but on the other hand, the, um, as a team member, they, they also feed you business. So there's some, there's some value to being on a team. Uh, going it alone means you're out there on your own doing your own thing. And you do it your way without anybody trying to control you. Um, if you want to get into the support side of the business, um, you can become a, a professional support person, which is a licensed individual that uh, supports a realtor or a group. Typically, they work for a team of realtors, and they they can do showings, answer questions, tend to um, tend to inspections, things of those of that nature. Um, there are certain rules that realtors have to follow that they don't want to follow. Like right now, if, if my client needs an inspection, I got to go sit there for two and a half hours while the inspector does his thing. It's the law. I got to be there. If I have a, an associate working with me that's licensed, they can go sit there for me. And I can get away with paying them to go do that. Um, so you could become a professional support, professional, uh, professional support person. And um, you're just not having to deal with all the stress and headache of being 
a full realtor and it doesn't cost you as much and um, your income can be leveled out a little bit better. Um, it, it can be, uh, you can actually get on a salary doing that. Uh, clerical support is just what it says it is, um, where you're, you know, just helping with paperwork and filing and all other things that your realtor wants you to do. So, and that that is typically um, a uh, paid position, uh, W-2 position. <clears throat> um, so a couple other, I'm sorry, questions have come in more on the money side of this, if you don't mind uh, me asking a couple sure. questions here. Sure. Um, so uh, someone says, would you recommend making a smaller down payment and using the rest of the home buying money that you saved uh, as your first payment to reduce the number of payments uh, and saving your money as well as uh, with interest? Um. I think you should put out as much of a down payment as you feel comfortable affording. I don't think you should try and manipulate um, your payments based upon down payment. Now, <clears throat> if you have um, if, if you have some extra money, there's a couple of things you can do. Um, one of the things you can do is you can buy down your points. So what does that mean? If you, um, I'm sorry, buy down your interest rate. If you are working with a lender that's offering you an interest rate, he may give you a quarter percent off if you give him an extra thousand or fifteen hundred dollars. That's not a bad use of money sometimes, but do the math. Make sure the math works for you. Um, if you can't afford your down payment, then question number one is, can you afford the house in the first place? And then question number two is, you know, uh, you, you're going to find basically what you're going to find is that your your payment, your your down payment, isn't going to affect your your monthly payments all that much. So yeah, you might be able to get. I mean, unless you're really making a significant difference in your down payment, you might be able to get you know, $10, $15 a month off of it. Um, if you're that tight, then be careful. Um, go with the lower down payment. You can always throw more money onto the loan later, but that will not change your payment, okay? It will shorten the length of the loan, but it will not change your payment. Um, so uh, that's kind of my caution there. Um, okay. Okay, and then someone says, can you combine a loan program with grants when buying a home? And um, I asked her, I wasn't for sure what she meant. And she said in her state, they have a, a program where um, for homeowners with student debt. So can they combine that with, let's say, FHA? Um, yeah, there's certain rules and rules are specific to the grant programs and what they allow. Uh, there are a couple of cities that offer grants. And there are a couple of, uh, I mean, there's just all kinds of different things out there. Um, that's a good question for your local realtor to an answer for you because they'll probably have a good idea. And if they don't, you and they can research it um, to, to get you the, the correct answer. But um, that's based on each individual municipality. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so at this point, I'm pretty much done with the formal presentation. If any of you want to call me and ask questions, uh, seek advice or whatever, more than happy to talk to you. I'll be, I'll answer any questions you have and, you know, to the best of my ability and I'll, I'll, you know, talk to you as short or long period as you want. Um, so you can discuss ideas with me. You can talk about advice or whatever. And if you're looking for a realtor in your area and your area isn't my area, I can do what we call a referral. And what I will do is I will find you a good realtor in that area. Okay. I have ways of doing that. And, um, and when I pass that referral down to that realtor, um, then they are somewhat responsible to me to make sure that you get good service. 
So what will happen is I'll follow up with them, you know, from time to time. So, so how are you doing with Alex, for example, um, or, or, or whomever, uh, with Kevin? Or, and um, uh, that I don't have a problem with doing. Um, so, you know, if you need a referral, call, me, call, call in to me and I'll be more than happy to do it. Um, the uh, flip snack uh, uh, address down there is the address for the Your Home booklet. Like I said, I did put that out into the chat box. So um, make sure that uh, you grab that before you go. You just copy it. And then um, whenever you're ready, drop it into a, uh, a browser. And then the book will just come up on your screen. And it's, it's like I said, it's a great piece. It doesn't take long to read, but it's really, really informative. And with any luck, I've said everything in there correctly to, to what it, you know, what, to what the book says. Um, so, um, so there's that. That's it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I will take more questions if, if they're there. Yeah, Madison asks, is there a secret network of Delta Sig realtors? I feel like there are several, but maybe it's just a coincidence that she knows so many. Well, Madison, maybe it's because you know everybody. Is that a possibility? Or uh, <laughs> that, so Sam, do you know anything about that? You know what? If there is a secret group, it's so secret that they haven't told me about it. Got it. Okay. Fair <laughs> no, enough. I don't, I don't I don't know of it. Um, I do know of a few that are out there, um, but uh, I don't. We've not formed anything at this point, to my knowledge. Got it. So, any other last questions? Please go ahead and put them in. Um, we do. Okay. Um, and he said, uh, she said, maybe there should be one for uh, more connection opportunities. You never know. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, good, good point. So if you have any questions, again, you're welcome to put, chat those in right now. We have like five more minutes. A couple of things I will mention, we will be getting this recording out to all of uh, those of you who registered, assuming everything went well with the recording. We say that because, well, it didn't happen one time. So, but you know, we had a little technical issue, um, long, long story, but uh, we're hoping we will get that out to you. Um, if you have any, I'm going to say, if you have any learning experiences or like your takeaway from this, we would love to hear it. Uh, you're welcome to put it here. You're welcome to send it to me. Um, just we welcome those opportunities. And then the last thing I'll mention, as I mentioned, this is this is part of our mini series. This is our third installment. We do have two more. The next one is that we have coming up is in March. It's on the 22nd. And again, we'll send this out to all of those of you who have attended and or who are registered as well. But uh, that will be about um, your uh, human resource benefits. So um, you will be walking into a room at some point and you're gonna have to start making some selections and you have absolutely no idea what they're talking about. What we're gonna do is help you uh, go through that process. Uh, personally, I think this is my uh, graduation gift or our graduation gift for anyone who is graduating within the next few years. You need to be on that call to understand what you're gonna be walking into. Uh, and again, you can call and thank us later once you actually go through that process and realize, wow, that's really good. And then the last one we will be doing is cybersecurity that will be on April the 5th. Again, we'll be sending you that information, but we would love um, you know, to have you guys join us. So with that, um, I think we are done. Unless you, again, if you would like to unmute, you're welcome to do so. So, and if not, then I will just say on behalf of all of the Cincinnati Alumni Chapter, we wanna thank all of you for joining us this evening. Special thanks to James Kuhn, who is our Regional Vice President, who lets us borrow his uh, Zoom um, account. Okay, poor guy has to sit through all of this with us and he supports the crazy things that we do at the Cincinnati Alumni Chapter. Um, and of course, how can we not say thank you to Sam Shaheen. And again, if any of you guys are looking, let me tell you, he is, call him, even if you're not in the Akron Canton Can area, he is a phenomenal resource and he is so willing to help you out. Uh, many, many years ago, we met and uh, it's an amazing uh, friendship that has lasted and, you know, would trust him 
I want to say with my life, but yeah, probably with my life. So he's, you know, we can definitely give you my highest recommendation for Sam. He's just an all around great guy. Thank you very much. So, anyway, thanks to all of you who attended again. And again, have a great night. We hope to see you next month uh, for our fourth installment. Thanks, guys. Have a great day. Night. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Do you Thank turn you. The recording off. Mm -hmm. The recording part of it. Uh, are, are we? Are we recording? Oops. We're still recording.